Okay, our next presenter is um, Gail, Gail Roberts from Blair Public Library. And her presentation, as you can see, is Hi Ho, Hi Ho, Where in the Library Do I Want to Go? So, Gail, welcome. Well, thank you, and thank you all for having me today. Um, I, I guess I'm the personal experience part of the program, so I will warn you that I'm not a huge PowerPointer. I'm used to talking in front of a group. So, you know, if you need to uh, have me explain when I'm raising my hands and, and uh, doing some kind of demonstration, I will certainly be happy to do that as well. So don't be afraid. And I, of course, would sing this. I would go, hi-ho, hi-ho, where in the library do I want to go? So, you know, feel free to sing with me anytime. Um, it's also known as my experience in library science or my library life story. But I don't want you to feel too bad. I'm not going to bore you with how I was born in Omaha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some simple rules because leadership always teaches us that even small groups or large groups, there's always some rules you need to set. So here are my rules when I present. Laughter is allowed. You can laugh all you want, but it's not necessary. Heckling is OK, too, but it's not very nice. So you take your pick. No rotten tomatoes. It's a mess for these ladies to clean up. And um, you could probably send me a picture of one if you think I, I did that bad. Uh, questions, comments, please, I can assure you, you do not just want to hear me ramble. And when we're talking personal experiences especially, it's always good to hear from everybody because that's what it's about and that's how we grow. Or at least that's my thought. Okay, and you'll notice I have rainbow hair because you can't really see me. I thought you should have a picture. This is my rainbow hair picture and um, some people don't necessarily want rainbow hair in their lifetime. I never did, but our children had read Oh my gosh, that year they checked out like 26,000 books during the summer and had turned in journals for over 13,000. So the deal was if they did really well, I would dye my hair. And they got to pick the color, but we had several that wanted rainbow. So I had rainbow colored hair for about four months. It was kind of fun. So you could try that if you feel adventuresome sometime. Okay, well in the beginning, in the beginning, I feel like a Star Wars movie. In the beginning, um, you know, you go through life, and life builds all these experiences. And I did not start my journey into library science until I was in my 40s, so, um, which, of course, was only like a year ago. And, and that's a place where you would laugh. And um, uh, so to get there, and you know, I did school. And in high school, I can tell you that I always went to the library. And I was always straightening the books. Nobody asked me to. I just did it. I didn't know it was called fronting. I just knew that it looked messy to me. And I wanted to be able to see all the books nice and neat on the, on the shelf. And then I got my very first um, job, which uh, my mother was dismayed that I would go to work at any point in my life. And I was 17 and a half. And I worked on a psychiatric um, nursing care unit and a male psychiatric nursing care unit, which becomes important when you know my mom because she didn't think I ever should be around men. So, you know, it was a truly eye-opening experience for me. And then I, of course, went back to school because life continued and I needed to earn more money. So I went into legal, uh, the legal world and I became a legal secretary. So I worked at a law firm. They didn't have any money, so they shipped me off to their friends. So I worked in accounting. Then I went back to law, blah, blah, blah. And um, when I was there, <laughs> at all those different firms, no matter where I went, I managed the library. I filed all of the updates and all of the um, those little bitty, real thin sheets that you have to, had to put in those three ring binders that nobody does anymore because it's all online. But I always managed all the libraries. Nobody even asked me to. I just said, I need to do this because this is what I like. And never thought I should be a librarian. Heavens, I've wanted to be a teacher since I was eight, and then a nurse, and then an archaeologist, and then a teacher. And so anyway, uh, finally, I, the law firm kind of dissolved, and I went into soybeans. I didn't know Omaha cared about soybeans. But there is a wonderful cooperative here called Ag Processing. 
and I joined them and I worked in their payables department and then within a few years I had worked my way up into we had opened our own law and insurance department and I was the paralegal for that. So they sent me to school to become an actual paralegal so they could pay me more money. And um, in the meantime, I took over all the filing systems and I ran and I managed the library, of course, and I developed a central filing system for the entire national firm to use, which they still use today. So again, there I was organizing and straightening and filing and maintaining and did not even in my head, associate that with librarianship. Went back to school after AGP because I had to uh, quit. My father had become very ill, and I felt I would, needed to be home with him, so I took a year off. And in that time, I went to finish my bachelor's degree, and I focused in history because that's kind of what I did. And one day, I then started my master's in history program, and my professor that I hung out with all the time looked at me and he was like, what are you going to do with your life? And I was like, I don't know. You guys promised me a job. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I don't think I'm grown up yet. And so we kind of talked about it a little bit. And then he had his legal research classes. And so I went in and the librarian that night happened to be ill. And she just kind of showed us the books and said, there's databases, here's the books. Write me an email if you have a, a message. I've got to go home. I'm sick. And so he went home, you know, she went home, and I raised my hand and offered to teach that class. And so I taught them all how to do their legal research. <laughs> and he was like, you should be a librarian. And I was like, oh, do you have to go to school for that? <laughs> he was like, I don't know, ask these people. Work here. So I did. And I worked at the UNO library for 11 years or so. When I started there, I didn't think I had any library experience. But truly, I had fronted, I had organized, I had programmed, I had taught. So there were things that I had done already all my life. I just never thought that that's what it was. So history really got me into librarianship. And it, I always think that's kind of a funny thing. But that evaluation of school, work, life, which all equals experience, and then I got into library leadership and networking and mentoring. And I have lots of stories about everything. But all of that became how I followed and found my path and my passion in library science. I was only at UNO for three days. And I, you know, talked to dad, said, you know, I'm going back to work. And, you know, we can get a nurse to come in, yada, yada, all that kind of stuff. And I came home and after three days he said to me, wow, you are so happy. I have never seen you so happy. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm just where I should be. And I'm just like, you know, all excited, all excited. And he looked at me and said, okay, well, I need to go to the doctor. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I took him to the doctor the next day and his cancer had spread and they told me it was time to put him in hospice, which meant I had to quit because you have to be at home full time. I wasn't going to put him in a hospital. He wanted to die at home. And so I went in and my supervisors and uh, new friends at the library were just so very kind and said, no, we are not losing you. I was like, well, you've only had me for three days and I just don't think it's fair to you to, you know, make you wait. They're like, nope, you just come back when it's done. And luckily it didn't take very long for him or for them. It was only two weeks and I came back and again knew that's what I wanted to do. Talked to who I became very close with and mentored with and got hooked up into the MLS program. Went on, ended up here in Blair with many stories in between. But I think my point here is that all of your life and everything you do is part of what makes you the librarian you are. And so in your journey and in your path in your field or in your career, you want to take your experiences and apply them to your, your personal path and your personal journey. When I was at the psych unit, three things happened to me that I have always lived with close in my heart and I have always kept those lessons and I apply them 
in librarianship just as much as I applied them in my in my personal life. So if you can bear with me while I give you those three stories, they're kind of, um, you know, and if you if you're tired of listening to me, just raise your hand and say, okay, move on. But um, the first one, uh, like I said, it was a it was a county nursing facility. I was 17 and a half years old, and I went to work on this male unit, um, and I trust me, did not tell my mother anything I did because I knew she would have just conniption fits. I was the only girl in my family. I had four brothers who would beat up any boy that even came close to me. You know, I've just never been around a lot of fellas. And nor did I ever have a job. I had volunteered a lot, but I'd never actually had a job. So this was an institution that was really ugly. It had that ugly yellow tile, and, and it, it just looked like an institution. And there was never any decorations up. So I went to my nurse and I said, could we start a craft table at night? Could we do something to make decorations to hang up? And you know, when people make things, they feel good about themselves. And I guess that kind of sounds like a children's librarian in the works. Um, but she agreed, and so we started a craft table. Well, everybody liked it. The patrons really liked, not the patrons, the patients really liked it. And they would all sit around and visit and stuff. Well, we had four men who had been in the concentration camps. And they were, uh, two of them had been at Auschwitz, and two had spent time at Dachau. And the one who had been at Dachau had never spoken. He had been there for years, had never talked to anybody, and he would do everything by hand signals. He would tell us if he had a headache or a stomach ache, and I just, you know, I'm patting my head in my stomach, so you can kind of picture that. Um, but he would just never talk. And so we were sitting there making shamrocks for St. Patty's Day, and we were all laughing, and they were drinking their juice and whatever. And he came over, and he sat down beside me, and he began speaking, and he talked about his time at the camp. And for over two hours, we listened to this man. Hopefully I don't cry. For two hours, we listened to him. And it was absolutely amazing. And to this day, I can't tell you a word he said, but I can tell you what happened and what it meant to me. He, he finished. We did, had not done our chores. We didn't worry about baths. We didn't interrupt him at all. We just let him talk. So he got up, we started cleaning up the craft table, he went to the nursing station, kind of patted his tummy like he had his stomach ache again. She gave him his medicine, he walked right past me, fell down, and died. Now at 17 and a half, that was pretty emotional for me, but we, I mean, we got down, we performed CPR, we knew it wasn't going to help, and he passed away. But the lesson I took from him through my entire life and into my world of librarianship is that you always have a story. Everyone has their story. It's what is behind who they are and how they behave. Sometimes they just need someone to listen. So always listen. I don't care how busy I am. I can go to the store. I swear I have. I'll listen to your story written on my forehead. You know, I stand, I don't care how busy I am, I listen to their story. Because for all I know, that could be their last time. Or I might be the only one who listened. So that was the first thing. The second thing I really learned from them, and again, at a very naive 17 and a half, it was a good thing to learn, was at Christmas time, those who had family would bring clothes. And we would automatically take our little Sharpie marker and put their name under the collar or someplace so that the laundry would know to send their, their stuff back to our ward. And I took one of this gentlemen came up and he had all this whole stack of new clothes. And he started crying when I got out the, shop, the Sharpie marker. And he had really big green eyes and so those big tear puddles, kind of like a kid, you know. Um, and I was like really sad all of a sudden. I was like, well, what can I do? What's the matter? And he said, well, do you have to write my name in there? Because sometimes that, that goes through. And, and when we go to the movies or the stores, then people know that we're not in a house and that we're, we're from someplace different. And they make fun of us. So I thought about it. And I thought, well, it's not very nice to judge. And my lesson was, 
don't judge people. Don't judge by how they look or how they act. You don't know their story. And that impact on that person could be irreparable. I think now sometimes we even call it bullying. So I started doing hand, you know, I started making hand labels out of fabric I had at home and I would come in and sew it into their shirts so that they didn't have to worry about that anymore. The third one, and probably the most personal one, but one that is true with your patrons, with people you know, just with everybody. We finally combined our units and we put the women with the men. And I worked on the advanced psych instead of the basic psych. So we had a lady who was never really violent, but she every once in a while would just have an episode just to make us think she was. And uh, I kind of thought about it a long time. And she was very intelligent. She would have really good conversations with you. And then one day she'd walk up and just call you chicken or egg or something silly to make you think she was having an episode. Eventually, our facility closed. They turned it into a Veterans Association facility. And she was married to a vet, so she got to stay. And she was there, and we were very short of help. And it was a very tense time, and, and it was really hard because we were full. And there was just, you know, it was high care and not enough people. And one day I went in, and I saw her in bed, and I went over to see her. And she had been beaten by a staff member. And I just could not tolerate that. I was like, no, that does not happen. You, don't, you do not have to put up with that. And I'm going to you know, get this information. I'm turning it into the head nurse. And I'm writing it up. And she looked at me. And she just went, well, why do you put up with it? And I said, what do you mean? I'm not. I'm going to write this up because <laughs> nobody should do that to you. And she said, no, you live with the same thing. I see it in your eyes. And she was right. I had been in an abusive relationship in the marriage, and I didn't know how to get out. And so my lesson from that was to always be prepared for and practice honesty. Others see more than you can see yourself sometimes. And I've learned that with patrons from the time I've started. If you aren't honest with them, they see that, and they'll either not respect you or not listen to you as well, which frustrates you. Um, that happened at UNO. I've seen it many times. And so I always try to treat that person with honesty, respect, and I listen. And I think if you do those things, others will do the same to you. And I promise that's my last really personal type of thing. But I think that they're good lessons. And as we look at those lessons that we've learned in our life, we can put that into our path and make our path even more um, complete and enjoyable for ourselves. So experience really matters. Um, it's important when you work in the library. It teaches you that humanity that you need to work with, with people. And you might say, well, I am a cataloger. I am only going to catalog. <laughs> and I love cataloging. And I am happy for you if that's true. But you still, in cataloging, are reaching out to people. And it is still a public service. And so you need to remember how it feels when you can't find something and how you honestly felt about it. And so you make your cataloging work so people can find what they need. You take it in every field you work in. The other thing I learned quickly through UNO was leadership. And that leadership doesn't start at the top necessarily. You can lead from any position. There is training out there if you're not a natural leader, which I never thought I was. And so I was anxious to be trained for more information. And when I went to the Nebraska Library Leadership Institute, which I would recommend to anybody, um, it is a very inward, you know, again, it's an inward look at who you are and what kind of leader you are and explains kind of people so that you can learn how to hone your leadership skills and work with others and understand where they're coming from. And so one of the questions was, when was, and that was the first question we had to answer, when was the first time you were a leader? So I want to hear everybody just kind of type quick or whatever, when were you a leader? When was the first time? Think about that.
I'm waiting with anticipation. Anybody? Have I put you all to sleep? Uh, not here. Um, yeah, go ahead and type into the questions section of your interface uh, and go to webinar, everyone, and we can share that um, with Gail and everybody. Oh, someone says when they became when they were an older sister. That's good. Uh, in 4-H as a teenager, Terry Johnson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is Janet from Lincoln, and I just wanted to mention that when I was in um, living in Michigan and I started working my first job, technically, after I was in the Navy, and they put me in charge of the food section in this restaurant of serving, you know, of um, cooking the food, which was really odd because I never had that kind of experience before. I was just <laughs> the oldest person that applied for the job. So evidently age mattered. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Uh, someone else says, all of her sisters vied for leadership. Now they have agreed to take turns. Uh -huh. There we go. Well, all of those are good, but I bet if you really think, you can even go back farther. And that's what they were making us do. And the first time I was a leader, I mean, they had to make me really think, because I was picking, you know, 17 when I took the um, fertilizer sales, and I was the top fertilizer salesperson, and things like that at school. But really, the first time I can really, really remember it is when I was eight years old in 4-H, and nobody would stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance and hit the gavel to start the meeting. And I thought that was silly. So I stood up, said the Pledge of Allegiance, <laughs> hit the gavel, started the meeting, and then they elected me president since I could do that. So apparently, we have all been leaders since we were very small. We just didn't realize that that's what we were doing. And so all those things where you remember where you were that leader, that still means you are. So you can lead in your job at any position. You do not have to be the director. You do not have to be the dean. You don't have to be the president. You can lead from any position you are. And that's what makes us all wonderful teammates, wonderful coworkers, and wonderful visionists. So that was my other story was that, that little part. It's, it's just an important thing to realize that we do have that in us. So once you realize that you already have led before, you can lead again. And as you walk down that path, and, and as I was working at UNO, I went from you know, working reference, I started taking over um, the student workers, and I, I ended up taking over mending, and then I worked myself into exhibits and curating the exhibits and doing the electronic signage and promotion and marketing. And I loved every single thing I did. And I found, you know, through my path that there was still something kind of missing, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And I had gone back to school. I was taking these um, classes. I was becoming this librarian that I thought I had to be. And I, you know, as I was going through classes even, you know, they're saying, well, you know, as you're, you know, are you going to go into administration? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? And I'm thinking, well, I can't possibly go into administration because I haven't worked in libraries all my life. And, you know, so the, the Leadership Institute really helped me focus on me and who I was and how I got along with other people. And you can do some of that online for free. You don't necessarily have to go to a class. There's tons of books out there. Um, there's a wonderful book. I can't remember. I think it's called Did You Fill Your Bucket Today? Something like that. And that's a kid's book also, but it's, the kid's book came from the adult book. And, you know, it's, it's how, you, how you go about not forgetting who you are, and doing for others with your leadership abilities. So that leadership part does play a part in your path. Again, don't have to be the top leader, but you always can lead. Professional development was another key to my path that I just, I can't even begin saying enough about. And uh, <laughs> consequently enough, um, my first connection with professional development 
when I started at UNO, after I had worked there a little bit, um, one of the workers came up to me and said, I want you to join NOA and join the para group. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> should I do this? And I went to my little supervisor mentor person and I said, should I do this? And she's like, oh, absolutely. And so I did. And they immediately, you know, he got me to come to a meeting and I joined. And, and then they took me to my first NLA conference. And oh my gosh, it was Halloween. We were supposed to dress in costume if we wanted to. So I found this old witch outfit. And I looked pretty silly. I had green makeup on and whatever. And if you know me, that's not unusual probably. But it's, um, you know, it was just funny. And so he goes, well, I, I signed you up to take lunch with the paraprofessionals. I'm like, okay. So I'm following them around. And I get there, and they presented me with the Para of the Year Award. And I cannot tell you what that meant. It was, again, because I never had seen myself so much the leader, and I didn't feel that I'd been in the profession long enough. But apparently what I was doing was good work. And I was so appreciative of that award. And then, of course, they got me to run for vice chair and eventually they had to suffer through me being a chair. But we had fun and we had a good time. And I learned a lot and I networked with all those people. And all those people began sharing their stories with me and sharing their paths. And so I looked at what I was learning at school and all the paths that I'd seen and I was like, I'm liking what I'm seeing. I just got to figure out where I want to go. So I, you know, picked some mentors, and I would, I would say, find some mentors that you can always go to. Uh, some of my mentors have retired, but I still go to them. Um, some are still active, you know, some not in libraries, but still active and um, understand where I'm coming from and the questions I'm asking. So find those mentors. Mentors can be there by email, text, personal. However, anymore, it's such a small world, thanks to that web, that, that there's really no way you can't. You can find somebody who will listen, even teachers, um, coworkers, uh, a patron that you really like that just needs to listen to your story as much as you've listened to them. So mentors really, really helped. I started going to webinars. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know that sounds kind of silly in a way, maybe, but I think um, our first presenter said it too. There's webinars, there's free stuff out there to look at. So I started trolling, and I, again, I listened to those stories to see where it was. I joined ALA, and you know I was a student at the time, so I got to pay the student rate. But I went to a national conference at the ASLC, the children's section in Utah. Oh my gosh, what a difference that made for me. You know, just talking to, again, other people who, who had visions that were similar to mine and, and we could work off each other and, and they weren't people that were like in my local network so I could really talk freely and not have to work, feel too stupid if I didn't have a good idea or anything. And, and you know, it was just like freeing. And I went with some people from, um, from our area, too. There were three of us, and uh, we had gotten to go from a grant that Dr. Pasco had gotten us. And it, it was just an amazing, life-changing thing. And I, I have a book that we were just talking about today, and I thought, oh, I have to throw this in here. Um, if you have not read The Boy Who Was Raised by Librarians, you should. It's a picture book by Carla Morris. Now, Carla Morris was a librarian in Utah. She's still there. And I, you know, really hadn't read the front of the book very much. I just read the story. And I loved it, and I loved it. And I think it speaks wonderfully of customer service, which is one of my, my key passions. And um, I met her. And she was there, and I met her. And I was just like, oh, I loved your book. And she signed it for me. And we were just chatting because nobody else was in line at that point. And she was telling me her story and her path. And I was just like, this is just so cool. And I said, I just love Melvin in the book. And she said, well, you know, Melvin is real. And I was like, no, because Melvin goes from being this little kid who comes to the library all the time to a librarian. He becomes a librarian. I was like, no. And so she, they called him over. And he was the guy that was running all our IT stuff. And so she called him over, and he 
went to shake my hand and I was like, oh my gosh, no, I need a hug. I love you. And so he hugged me and he and I talked for like four hours and he told me his entire story and path and, and I just grew to love the public library sector from these conferences and these people that I had been you know, networking with that I just thought were fabulous. And I thought, wow, that is really cool. You know, here I thought I was going to be an academic librarian type person all my life. And, you know, I was like, this is just so cool. I love how people, people meet and people talk. And so I was doing my, my reference desk thing one day after I got back. And I had to help a kid who didn't know his alphabet very well. And he was a freshman. And uh, come to find out, he had... Uh, gotten to school, to college, on football scholarships. And so I was like, well, OK. You come in and meet with me every day. And I will help you learn your alphabet better. And we will teach you how to write a paper. And he did. And we worked on it. And we worked on it. And at the same time, I ended up doing the information literacy classes for, <clears throat> excuse me, for the junior high students that were coming in. and. I started a, a summer reading program for the daycare because I thought they should have something. So all of that just kept working in my head. And I finally went to my advisors and I said, I think I need to be a public librarian. And they were like, hallelujah, glory be, amen, you finally figured it out. And I'm like, why didn't you just tell me? And they're like, nope, you needed to figure it out. And so even though I thought I could be in this place that I loved and work as a library person in, the academic, you know, in an academic environment, I was like, I don't know anything about working in a public librarianship. And I'm like, sure you do. You know how to do all these things. You've been doing them. You have your path. And I was like, oh, let me think about that. So I thought about it, and I said, OK. So I made the switch, and I came to Blair. And Within six years, you know, after a few years, I became the director. And I absolutely love what I do and love working with the people. And I love listening to their stories. I love being that person. I have people that work for me who are not as into that, but they love the cataloging aspect. They love, you know, they still like working with the public, but they love those other things they do. So we've made a wonderful team. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm very happy for that. But sometimes, still, that library, you know, that library, should I be doing better thing comes into me. And so I went to the MPLA Leadership Institute, which as much as the Nebraska one focused on how to get along with other people and yourself, the MPLA one focused on how to get along with those people you have to answer to and what are the things that are important. And I met the president of ALA and spent a great deal of time with her. Um, we discussed the rules of Ring and Nathan, which I live by, and I get up and I do exercises to it, you know. Listen, take the time, save the time of the patron, and libraries are changing organisms. I just, you know, I quote them to myself every day. And I come to work and I get to do what I want, and I love that. I love being able to deal with new technology and explain new technology to people. I love working with the system and with libraries. And I love working with all of you. But sometimes it becomes overwhelming. And sometimes I find that I have way too much on my plate. Because I've been you know, put on this committee and that committee, or I filled in for somebody, and then it became a full-time thing. And, and then I have work things and like, you know, all these things that are just go, 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 go. And so sometimes, I have to tell you, you have to take time to smell the cookies, or roses, or whatever you like to smell. Hopefully, not like my grandson, who decided he would smell dogs, because dogs were always sniffing each other, and he wanted to see what they smelled like. But Find something you love. Take that time to do it. One of my mentors, a very smart lady, said, pencil in you time in your day planner. So you know what? Every couple months, I make my hair appointment for Wednesday mornings, and I go get my hair done. I take an afternoon every here and there and go to a movie. I go do something just for me. 
And then, you know, I schedule my Wednesday night family time. I schedule, I put that in my day planner, and those are things I cannot change. Listen to yourself as well as your patrons. Because, you know, your patrons will tell you when you look tired. And they'll tell you when you've kind of gotten off your path. So listen to yourself and listen to them. And they will help you maintain that balance if you let them and if you let yourself. So do that. I think that, you know, through my whole experience, and, and I'm always happy when um, uh, I, I work with students now that come and do their practicums with me or, or anybody, and I, I'm always excited when it's somebody in their 40s or later on that is making that career change because I know that their prior experiences will enrich in what they do. And all of us have those stories. Every single one of you has stories to tell us that would make our eyes water and we would shake our heads and say, yep, that's, that's exactly what I went through, or that isn't. And if you take all of those things and ball them up and you put them together and, and you, you know, direct yourself down that path and you pick those things to use when you need to out of your ball, you will have a rewarding experience. I have no doubt. There's my contact information. By gosh, if you ever want to talk or ever have questions, email me, call me. Let's have coffee. Well, tea. I drink tea. But, you know, anything. I, I will talk. I, as you can tell, I'm a talker. So, you know, find that path that you want to go on. You know, you might, you might say, my path is technical services. Awesome. There are some great ways we can get you to be the best technical service person you can be. Your goal is technology. Wonderful. I get to go to computers and libraries next or in April. I am so excited because I'm going to learn so much and I'll probably come back and be so overwhelmed that I won't even know what I'm supposed to do with it all. But it will be such a learning experience. You know, introduce those things. Um, if you work academic, find that niche where you want to be, electronic resource management. Um, gosh, there's so many things. Promotion and marketing is so much fun. I just, again, I just wish I could do everything because I love it. But you know what it ended up? It ended up that I needed to be the one to help all my employees find out what they want to do and streamline that into a successful library, which I hope we're doing and that we will continue to do. So I know I'm ending a t tad bit early, but that's so we can have questions, and because you're probably tired of me going blah, 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 blah. Um, So any questions? Anything I can answer? Um, no, that was Wait, great, Gail. Um, yeah. Um, if anybody has any questions, comments, thoughts on anything Gail said, you can type it into the questions section, or I can unmute your microphone from here. Do you have anything, Janet? Mm -hmm. Gail, this is Janet from Lincoln. Do you have your next step planned in your advancement in librarianship? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I had uh, wonderful experiences at the MPLA Leadership Institute. And um, one of the things I've missed that I haven't been doing since I took the directorship is publishing and working at a higher level. So I've joined some committee work on the MPLA level, and um, I'm looking at working with ALA for a while. So eventually, maybe for good, but for right now, I'm just going to work my way into some of their stuff and see how things work. Well, that sounds good. Do you, um, my, I have a second question. Well, you said you're you're involved in MPLA now. Are you still involved in NLA? Oh, absolutely. Um, I haven't been extremely active because we just started our building project, and that's kind of taking a lot of my time. Um, so I feel a little guilty that I haven't been doing as much. But I am active in SCIP, and I'm active in which I have a lot to do. and. Um, uh, I am on the advocacy committee for NLA, and I, I join lots of things, and uh, I'm happy to do whatever anybody asks me usually. 
I believe in getting involved. You know, if you get involved in your in your professional development, you come out of it with a lot of good things and a lot of good networking. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, Omaha, you're unmuted. You asked to be unmuted. And some? Yes, thank you. Um, we don't have any questions on this end, but um, um, I'd like to say a few things. Gail, this is Cynthia talking. Um, I know how active you are. I don't know you well, but I know how active you are. And I loved your presentation, how it highlighted so much the different possibilities, um, different directions that people could go in the library profession, whether or not they're a librarian or um, in library school, although that's the ultimate goal. Um, I, I thank you very much. Does anyone else have questions? That brings us to the end of our um, educational portion. What, Janet, do you have something else? No, we're good. Go ahead. Okay. I think that brings us to the e end of the educational portion of our spring meeting. And again, a heartfelt thank you to all of you, um, to all the wonderful speakers, three terrific presentations. And thank you to each of you who attended the meeting and um, for giving us a few hours of your time. Um, we're very glad you were able to be here today.